Lindsay. Good evening and welcome to this special Thanksgiving show. I was recently asked a question about James chapter 5 verses 1 through 8. The inquirer wanted to know if it had a special message for today. <laughs> to be honest, I had not really carefully studied this passage in that light before. I was shocked to find that its message really does apply to the end times and the situation we're in right now. Listen to what the Apostle James says. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. First, note the time to which this prophecy applies. It is to the last days, just before the Lord Jesus returns. Second, it is addressed to a very particular kind of a rich person that would be from a long line of those who became wealthy by defrauding the laborers of their wages. This is very important to note because the Bible does not condemn everyone who is rich. It is not a sin to have money. It's just a sin for money to have you. The Bible teaches, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I've seen the Lord bless some with much wealth because they use it to help the Lord's work. But James predicts, that there would be some extremely rich people who gained their wealth by defrauding the vast majority of those who do the labor for the economy. Yet the Lord will cause their wealth to become a snare to them because the world's economy will collapse around everyone, both the rich and the poor. And apparently, the greed of the rich will cause them to steal so much that the entire world economy will collapse. I believe that there is one group of rich people that perfectly fit this prophecy. One man conceived a brilliant plan to defraud more money from more people than anyone in history. He announced the essence of his strategy when he said, Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes its laws. Mayor Amschel Rothschild gathered and trained many disciples who worked with him to form an international system of central banks. Many of our greatest leaders warned about the danger of a central banking system. Thomas Jefferson, on the occasion of the first attempt of the Money Trust to establish a central bank in America, warned, if the people ever allow the banks to issue their currency, the banks and corporations which will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. President James Madison warned, History records that the money changers have used every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit, and violent means possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. President Andrew Jackson who squashed an effort to establish a central bank, warned, If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given them to use themselves, not be delegated to individuals or corporations. The U.S. Constitution specifies that only the Congress has the right to issue and control currency. President Abraham Lincoln gave one of the most powerful warnings against a central bank in America. He said, The money powers prey on the nations in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. The banking powers are more despotic than monarchy. 
more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. They denounce as public enemies all who question their methods or throw light upon their crimes. I have two great enemies, the Southern Army in front of me and the bankers in the rear. Of the two, the one at my rear is my greatest foe. The money power will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in the hands of a few and the republic is destroyed. In the beginning of the 20th century, the money power finally succeeded in establishing a central banking system that would totally control America's money. It was sneaked in to existence after most of the members of the U.S. Congress had left for the Christmas holidays of 1913. Under President Woodrow Wilson, a skeleton Congress passed into law a system that would rob Americans of their freedom and wealth. It was cleverly disguised in its name, the Federal Reserve Act. At the same time, the personal income tax system was enacted so that the government would be able to pay the Federal Reserve Board for its services. The Federal Reserve System is neither federal nor is it a reserve of money. It's controlled by a powerful international banker group, most of whom are not American. They answer only to themselves. America's elected Congress not only has no control over the Fed, but has no idea of its innermost activities. No real audit has ever been allowed by the Federal Reserve. In 1934, at the height of the Great Depression, Congressman Lewis T. McFadden of Pennsylvania courageously exposed what had happened. He declared, Every effort has been made by the Federal Reserve Board to conceal its power. But the truth is, the Federal Reserve Board has usurped the government of the United States. It controls everything here, and it controls our foreign relations. It makes or breaks government at will. No man and no body of men is more entrenched in power than the arrogant credit monopoly which operates the Federal Reserve Board and Federal Reserve Banks. These evildoers have robbed the country of more than enough money to pay the national debt. What the national government has permitted the Federal Reserve Board to steal from the people should now be returned to the people. The people have a valid claim against the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. If that claim is enforced, Americans will not need to stand in bread lines. Homes will be saved. Families will be kept. The Federal Reserve Act should be repealed, and the Federal Reserve Banks, having violated their charters, should be liquidated immediately. Faithless government officers who have violated their oaths of office should be impeached and brought to trial. And now, due to the insidious action of the money trust of central bankers, the economy of the world is tied to one basic system. This means that if one part fails, the entire system will fail. I believe that we are on the brink of seeing the world economic system collapse, and that will set up the coming of the Antichrist. But don't be dismayed. After his description of the corrupted riches of these last days, the Apostle James taught the true believer how to respond to the events around him. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? No amount of riches will ever be worth losing your soul. And you who are listening to me now, the vast majority of you have already received the gift of pardon that Jesus gave his life to give you. And so you have your soul in God's hands. Well, Chuck, it's been a long time since we've <laughs> been able to really uh, look into 
the latest things that are happening with regard to the coming of the Lord, the signs uh, that are there. I've been looking forward to this, Al, to just get together and you bet. exchange a few ideas. And This world is going so crazy. I'm anxious to get your perspectives, too. Well, you know what? I, I just see that everywhere I turn, and I know you've seen this, too, people are, people are scared. Yes, they the really, apathy. Yeah, yeah, the apathy seems to have turned to fear. Yeah, and that's really that's scary in itself. Yeah, a lot of people that uh, know nothing about Bible prophecy, nevertheless, are talking about uh, the fact that uh, it seems like things are coming to some sort of a crescendo, some sort of an end. How, and how? Yeah, we see it in the young people too. Yeah. They have no sense of destiny. That's right. And uh, it's it's. Uh, and the more you watch what's going on, not only in Washington, but in Wall Street, yeah, makes no sense. The, wow. the more you know about that whole world, uh, the more uh, bizarre. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is indeed. You know, I've just wondered from your perspective, what are two or three of the most important things that you've noticed that uh, are fulfilling the signs that we've been looking at for so many years. Well, as you've taught me from the beginning, you want to know what time it is, you look at Israel. Always and first. I have vivid memories as a child, I mean yeah. a young, very young person, yeah. how um, people thought Hitler was the Antichrist. But oh, there yeah. were two guys on the radio, um, uh, Harold H.A. Uh, 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 Ironside mm -hmm. and uh, M.R.D. Hahn. Yeah. And they both made the point that Israel could, uh, that uh, Hitler could not be the Antichrist because mm -hmm. Israel was not in the land, so and he right. was. They were regarded as fringe freaks, sort yeah. of uh, fundamentalists. They have these crazy because everybody knew Israel was over because of eighty seventy and all that. Sure. And uh, w on May fourteenth of forty eight, that debate should have ended. Yes. And uh, but I remember that so vividly as an impressionable. Uh, I was very interested in the Bible, very young, but even in those days, I was very intrigued that here are a couple of guys that had the courage and the guts to insist upon the literal word. And they embarrassed themselves publicly by taking that position. Mm -hmm. And they were right, of course, because Israel uh, was formed, like Isaiah said, in an hour. And uh, so uh, that, that's the fact that Israel's in the land. Today, we run the risk of taking that for granted. Yeah. We don't realize what an incredible milestone in human history that is. So that's, yeah. That would be my first thought. Yeah, you know, it's, it's almost like a, I've called it a hinge of history. Uh -huh. uh, I talked about this with my dear friend Jack Kinsella, who died several months ago. But uh, few people realize what a an absolute colossal fulfillment of prophecy that really was. They need to get into reading Ezekiel chapter 34 through 39 to see just how great that it is. Why has the world hated the Jew down through the centuries? Uh, it seemed like a perfect question to introduce my friend, Jack Kinsella. You know, Jack Kinsella has been the principal writer on my show for the last 14 years. And also, he plays the role of super sleuth. He's the guy that goes out and gets some intelligence that uh, very few people can find. Anyway, Jack Thanks for coming and being on the show. I really gr so glad to get uh, people to see you and to know how important you are to me. Well, thanks. Al. You know, uh, we we're talking now about uh, the fact that there really has to be a supernatural source behind all of this, and uh, what do you see is really the source and why there's such a hatred toward the Jew? Well, to begin with, as you point out, you know, we, there's really only three c combatants in this whole global conflict. You mm. know, there's the, there's the children of Israel, there are the, mm. the followers of Jesus, and then there are the followers of Allah. Mm. And so what, you know, uh, it was Osama bin Laden himself who set the framework. He said that, you know, this would be a war against the Crusader Christians, which is America. It's a yes. war for the United States yes. and against the Jews. The world hates Israel because Israel stands as the only reminder, of mm -hmm. the only physical reminder of God's, uh, God's dominion on the earth. Uh, Israel mm -hmm. claims its land grant directly from God, directly mm -hmm. from the Bible. That can't be allowed to stand. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if it's accepted that their mm -hmm. land grant is legitimate, then it, you know, next follows that the Bible is legitimate. If the mm -hmm. Bible is legitimate, then 
uh, the Koran has to rewrite itself. And mm. it just, it, the, the battle itself is, the winner is going to be the one who declares their sacred writing to be wrong. You know, it's really interesting, Jack, that uh, when God made the original covenant with Abraham, and the covenant that introduced the fact that he was going to choose them and create a nation from them because all the other nations had uh, tried to push the memory of God out of the way. He created a nation that would preserve uh, the record about him. It's interesting that in that original covenant in Genesis chapter 12 that God gave a promise of protection because God knew they were going to be hated. What, what's your take on that? What, I mean, uh, why were they called the chosen people? Well, they were chosen, God chose them to reveal himself unto the nations. Mm -hmm. You know, he says that very clearly in a number of places in Scripture. Uh, he makes a promise to the Jews that if they would walk in his statutes and keep his commandments, and they would be blessed beyond all the nations of the earth, and the rest of the world would look at them and mm. from their blessings know that he is God. Yeah, they'd know there is a God. Exactly. Yeah. Conversely, he said, if you don't walk in my statutes, if you do break my commandments, then I'll make you a curse and a byword and a reproach and a hissing so that the world will look at the incredible uh, withdrawal of blessings upon, upon you and still know that I am God. You know, the ultimate mm. uh, point, what the Jews were chosen for, is to reveal God to us. Isn't it amazing that whether they're in or out of fellowship with God or in relationship with God, <laughs> they prove the existence of God. Exactly. There, the Israel, there is no explanation for Israel apart from yeah. God. You, there's, no exp there's never been another nation like Israel in that they came back after 2,000 years of exile with their, you know, the co their kosher dietary laws, their language, mm. their uh, from all different places where they've been scattered. There are no Amalekites or Jebusites or yeah. even, the, even the Iraqis are, are not the Chaldeans of old. No. The Egyptians are not the, the Coptics of old. No. Uh, you know, they're, they're a new nation. Israel is exactly the same nation it was when it was dispersed by the Romans in AD 70. You know, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, we've talked about this. Remember, uh, one of Napoleon's generals said uh, uh, to, uh, or actually, he was a believer, one of his generals, and Napoleon asked him, he said, give me a proof that the Bible is true. And I understood he said, your majesty, the Jew. Exactly. He said, why? And he said, well, just look. And he basically, he's going through what we're talking about right Precisely. now. Precisely. Israel is a miracle nation. The Jews are yeah. a miracle people. Yes. The, the Bible, Zephaniah promised that in the last days, God would return unto them a pure language with which they could worship him again. And in 1948, Ben Yehuda revived classical Hebrew as the working language of Israel. Now, Hebrew was a dead language Absolutely. before Latin was developed. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing fulfillment of prophecy. It, 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 it's extraordinary Absolutely. to go over there and to hear classical Hebrew as, as the language of the people. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 I'm sure that we're going to follow on on a lot of what we're talking about because I think the world needs to know just how important it is to understand the supernatural factors behind all of this. Absolutely. All Bible prophecy revolves around the existence of the state of Israel and the promises God made to Israel, both in the, you know, at, at the time of Abraham and then all of the Old Testament prophets. Mm. Each of them had made some reference to Israel in the last days, and everything revolves around them. In fact, mm. everything about uh, the, the last days begins. You can trace it, all of the various elements of Bible prophecy to that exact same point in history mm. in 1948 when Israel yeah. was restored. And folks, we're going to have a lot more to say about that. As a matter of fact, uh, a book is in the works about that. We'll be right back. Somewhere along the way, it's my suspicion mm -hmm. that uh, that'll, that'll pop up in the news. It won't be a sudden thing. It's a thing that will be talked about, argued about, and it'll take time for it to, to occur, time for it to be relevant. Uh, so those are not things that will happen in 30 days. Those are things that take some time. But uh, again, uh, I see that as a prerequisite to, the, to, to Armageddon, the, to, to the real wrap-up where Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing that leads me to, in my own perception, to recognize is the harpazo, the rapture. The distance between it and the second coming may be substantial.
Mm -hmm. uh, could be several decades. I'm not, I, don't, I personally suspect it can't be more than 38 uh, years. But the point is, um, uh, the, uh, when we make our little charts, we often jump to conclusions. I think the, the Harpazzo is very close. Mm -hmm. The second coming, I see it, it's going to, I visualize at least a decade or two away. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but th I mention that as a sign, not as one that's happened, but it's a, it's a litmus test we can put out. And it's just a test to see if we're tracking, uh, if we really do take the text literally. Well, I'll tell you something. I, I've always believed that somehow uh, Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon, would be rebuilt. Oh, so, so see, now we're, the, the, see, we my favorite, agree. where two people agree, one is redundant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel that uh, uh, there, that the rapture, the taking away of the church, would almost have to happen before Babylon would be rebuilt. Probably so. And there's a lot of reasons. And, and I agree with you that there may be some, some uh, undisclosed time lapse mm -hmm. between Harpazo. The, We're together. The, uh, I've always, I always call it the, the snatching out. The, yeah, the, the, the great belief. snatch, yeah, I think, the, was your title. That's right. I, I think that uh, I've always said that people kind of automatically think the seven-year tribulation begins immediately mm -hmm. with the snatching out of the believers. Yeah, I know. So there has to, but there has to be some sort of a lag there because the Antichrist cannot come until after the rapture. There we go. We agree. From Second Thessalonians 2. That's right. Uh, you have to, ha he can't. You have to have a gap. Yeah, he can't uh, be revealed until his Harpazo. So he has to be revealed, come to power, and power enough to enforce a covenant. Exactly. That could be an hour or it could be many, many years. We that's don't know. right. Yeah. So we agree there. That's, uh, that's, but I remember your, your uh, great snatch in your book. You know, <laughs> Uh, it must be interesting for you that your, that book, Late Great Planet Earth, was translated in how many languages? Thirty-five languages or something? Fifty-four. Fifty-four languages. That's that we know of. Well, it's you know there were there were pirated editions. And I I'm don't happy, think I'm happy they were pirated. I, I don't think you can go to a corner anywhere on the planet Earth and not run into someone whose life was changed and impact by that incredible book. And and uh, I, I uh, that 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 that. That's yet to be equaled. Uh, nothing's had that impact. But it's, uh, it's exciting to be able to reconnect with you, by the way. Oh, it is. Because, I, uh, it's been a long time, Chuck. Yeah, it's, and uh, I'm, I'm sure glad to reconnect with you. Well, let's you know, this is strange, because both our travels have, uh, we haven't crossed for a while. So, so we created an entity called the Koinonia Institute. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things, when we first formed the, the think tank, mm -hmm. I set aside some honorary gold medallions because I always assumed somewhere along the way we would be finding each other on the same speaking platform. Uh -huh. And because, for some weird reason, we just have never crossed paths at a time when I wanted us to cross paths. And so I always planned to embarrass you <laughs> with a presentation of a, our gold medallion. The, we have the uh, uh, now we see through, in, in the Greek, see mm -hmm. through glass darkly, then face to face. Mm -hmm. That's our emblem. But then we also surround it with the great, the uh, uh, great, com you know, commandment in Hebrew mm -hmm. on, the, on the outside. But anyway, beautiful. if you would accept that oh, as an honorary I, member I'm of our country. I'm greatly honored. So I just wanted to spring on, I'm I was going to embarrass you in front of an audience sometime, <laughs> but uh, I, I, rather than have, time is slipping by for both of us. So I, yeah, I'm well, greatly <laughs> honored. I'll tell you, that's beautiful. <laughs> So that's our, our little little gesture there. Well, I love you, brother. I love you too, And my this friend. has been... Uh, As I've told many of my friends, to be I'll even back together. you when you're wrong. <laughs> well, you're I you're, no, you're, goes both ways. You're a friend. Yeah, you betcha. No, well... I, that friend, the, the, uh, the, I've had the privilege of being really tutored by Walter Martin, Chuck Smith, but you're the guy mm -hmm. that really the, the Lord used to recruit me in the full-time mission. I've never forgotten that. And Praise I just, the Lord. I just, uh, Praise the Lord, uh, brother. So it's... It's just been a delight to be reconnected with you here and, well, I and pray plot that, and scheme together yeah, here. We, we will be plotting and scheming again, I'm sure. You've been listening to a dear friend, Chuck Missler, and uh, he's had an extraordinary ministry. He usually has unusual things that he does, but they're all effective. 
So I'm very grateful. Well, thank you, my friend. To have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. And God willing, we'll see you later. Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. The 2015 Prophetic Year in Review. From the perspective of Bible prophecy, 2015 may be remembered as the year Satan's key project began to rise. Since at least the time of Nimrod, Satan has been laying the foundation for a one-world government with his man in charge. Through the millennia since, he's had successes and setbacks. But in 2015, the foundation became complete enough for him to begin building the actual edifice. If you have the guts to be a real revolutionary, come forward right now and accept Jesus Christ as your real revolutionary. And he'll make a revolutionary that'll change lives. As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity, maybe even our last opportunity, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. In Matthew 24, 12, Jesus prophesied that in the time leading up to his return, lawlessness will abound. Humanity is sick with sin. Sin makes law necessary. Law is the stability needed for man to build civilization. First Timothy 1 says, We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. Romans chapter 1 verse 32 describes the lawlessness of a civilization on its last legs. It says, although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Where does it all lead? To the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 call him the lawless one. Lawlessness can refer to breaking the laws of God. It can also refer to breaking human law. It can even mean holding law itself in low regard. It simply reflects the teachings of our universities. We are suddenly soft on crime because so many people have been taught the right and wrong are relative. And that means there is no wrong. A few weeks ago, I told the sad story of the young couple who died at the hands of ISIS terrorists. They were bicycling through a small Muslim country in Central Asia. Not long before his death, the young man wrote, evil is a make-believe concept. Many reject Jesus Christ because they don't believe evil is real. If there is no evil, there is no such thing as sin. If there is no sin, there is no punishment for that sin. If there is no eternal punishment for sin, then who needs God's grace 
to escape that punishment. Satan's goal is to convince the world that there is no creator, so there is no absolute right and wrong. Once the world believes that, then lawlessness will rule the day. Folks, we are dangerously close to that time right now. I've told you before that I think the mark of the beast from Revelation 13 might be a computer chip. It will be implanted beneath the skin of the right hand or forehead. The chip could contain a numeric prefix issued by the Antichrist government. The presence of that number would confirm the chip recipient's acceptance status with the government. The scripture says, and he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Sweden is taking a giant step in that direction. Thousands of Swedes are having a microchip implanted into their bodies so that they don't need to carry key cards, IDs, and even train tickets. About 3,000 people in Sweden have inserted a microchip, which is as teeny as a grain of rice under their skin over the past three years. At a small company in Wisconsin, dozens of employees volunteered to receive chip implants. They use them to buy snacks, use the photocopier, and log into computers. In the future, an implanted chip could replace the keys to a person's car, house, and office. It could serve as a driver's license, social security card, and passport. If an accident leaves a victim unconscious, first responders would have instant access to the person's entire medical record simply by scanning the chip. They could also monitor what's going on inside the victim's body, like blood oxygen levels, heart rate, glucose levels, and temperature. By the time the mark of the beast is imposed on the public, people will be accustomed to such things. We are already willing to trade our privacy for convenience. It will all seem so logical and responsible. Mark of the Beast technology will offer the promise of convenience, security, and health. It will also provide the ability to buy and sell, just as the Bible warns. What will people be willing to trade for that? Their souls. On August 28th, a red heifer was born in Israel. The prophetic significance of this could be huge. Numbers chapter 19 gives specific instructions to the priests on the slaughter and burning of the red heifer. The ashes were mixed with water. It was then used to purify anyone who had touched a dead human body. Under the law, such people were considered unclean. They were not allowed to come to the tabernacle or later the temple until they performed the purification ceremony. According to Jewish tradition, there have been only nine red heifers used in this ceremony. That makes sense because ashes keep indefinitely. Only a teeny portion of the ashes were used during the purification process. Breaking Israel News reports, according to Jewish tradition, there will only be 10 red heifers in human history with the 10th heifer ushering in the Messianic era. London's Mirror newspaper breathlessly reported the birth of the latest red heifer just two weeks ago. A Bible prophecy has been realized 
as the first red heifer in 2,000 years was born in Israel. But we shouldn't be too hasty. There is no guarantee that the heifer will remain completely red or that it will not be injured or develop a blemish. But this latest red heifer is being nurtured as part of the Temple Institute Raise a Red Heifer program. That means it will receive perfect care. Rabbi Kaim Richman wrote about it on the Institute website. We cannot help but wonder and pray if there are now red heifers. Is ours the era that will need them? We know from the prophecies of Jesus that a third temple will be built. Thousands of Jews are working toward that goal today. Temple Institute personnel are using DNA to identify young men from the priestly line of Aaron. Many of those young men are already training to become Levitical priests. The Institute is creating ceremonial furniture and utensils. They're making plans to erect the third temple with unprecedented speed. And they are using the modern techniques of animal husbandry to produce a suitable red heifer. In the New Testament, God does not require the slaughter of animals, but religious Jews who have not accepted Jesus as their Messiah still believe they need a red heifer as part of the temple system. That's why they believe that when a red heifer is needed, one will appear. Folks, if you haven't noticed before, we live in amazing times. What a privilege it is to be alive in these days and see the ancient prophecies being fulfilled before our eyes. That means the return of Jesus to snatch away his church is close. It could happen at any time. I spent several years in the 60s and the early 70s ministering on college campuses. I experienced firsthand the results of many professors' teachings. Even then, it was anti-God. It included a humanistic form of Marxism that urged a violent overthrow of the society. I watched with grim fascination when student activists put into action the philosophies they had been taught. They rioted, blew up buildings, and burned down banks. The same professors who had fed these ideas to their students began expressing concern. And the students rightly called them hypocrites. The educational system of the era injected the destructive philosophies of men like Karl Marx into our society. When the Soviet Union collapsed, most Americans thought we were done with Marx. But on campus, his ideas never went out of fashion. They continued to shape new generations of young leaders. More than any other element, of our society, schools are most guilty of spreading atheism, communism, and relativism. For decades, Americans have been saying that education holds the answer. If that were really true, things would be bleak indeed. But there is a real hope, solid, strengthening, and certain. I'm talking about the hope found in the Bible. Some of you have come to a point where you refuse to even watch the news. It seems to be nothing more than a crescendo of despair. I know how you feel, but here's something that will help. The world's present condition fits precisely the conditions prophesied in the Bible. That means that the things that tempt you to despair should also bring you hope. You see, the God who accurately told us that these bad things would happen in the world also told us that we have a fantastic future. 
The Bible alerts us to the events and trends that will precede the return of Jesus. The long-awaited Messiah will soon come back and bring in his new world order. It will not be devised by politicians or managed by men. Despair and violence will end. But before these wonderful things happen, there will be tough times. One of the predictions for the age preceding the second coming of Christ is the disintegration of society. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we see the impact of man's choice to push God and his word out of his life and memory. In the last days, there will be very difficult times for people who have only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. What happens when a society rejects God? The choice is to accept the truth or suffer the consequences. But this time, it's reality, not a game show. Earlier, I quoted Romans 1.32. When we look at the verses leading up to that one, we begin to see the consequences of society rejecting God. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Those are rough consequences. Thank God for the light at the end of the tunnel. God has a plan to right all wrong and deliver everyone who trusts in him. You can be a part of his plan the choice is up to you. Things may be grim now, but they won't stay that way. Long ago, the psalmist said, weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. The person who knows Jesus Christ does not need to stick his head in the sand. We can be realistic and still shout for joy, and we can be ready for whatever happens. Peter wrote, think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Live as God's obedient children. We don't have to live in fear today. Or no matter what happens, we don't have to be afraid. Because God's promises will be kept if the world turns upside down. What we need to learn is the only source of true reality is what God has promised. And we need to get away from the, the thing that we make, we developed the habit of from childhood of going by our emotions, going by our human viewpoint. And I mean by that, going by our ability to cope with the problems we meet. And instead, looking at things from God's viewpoint and facing them in the light of 
believing God and facing them and dealing with them with God's power, not ours. And that changes everything. Everything. Crack the faith barrier. That's what it is. You have to crack through from looking at everything as you always have from your ability to cope with them from the human viewpoint and learn to look at things in life from the standpoint of God's ability to cope with them every time we believe that he will. It's been my experience. He has dealt with things I couldn't have possibly coped with every time I believed him. And when I screwed up and didn't believe him, I went to the divine woodshed. <laughs> and it's, it's really scary. And I got out of there as fast as I could. Though you have not seen him, you love him, Jesus. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, when you really get a grip on the fact that when you accepted Jesus Christ, in that moment, you change your eternal destiny. As it says in John chapter 5, verse 24, where Jesus said, He that hears my word, and believes him that sent me, has, in the great present tense, you already have, eternal life, and shall not come into judgment, but have already passed from death to life. John chapter 5, verse 24. You know, even when you're a believer, and I put myself in this, Many times we just don't really calculate what that means. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. Nothing's going to keep you from it. And all of heaven's Lord is already assured. The more that gets a grip on you, you start having inexpressible joy. Because you look and see what this old world is and where it's going and the miseries that you can experience here. And you spend some fun too, sure. But nothing can compare with what you've been given. When you get a grip on that, your heart will fill with joy. The hardest transition to make in the human mind is to begin to think in terms of eternity rather than in terms of this life. That's the hardest transition to make. And yet the more we know of what God has done, the more we meditate upon this in the Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to not only teach us but to enable us to believe it, the more we're going to want to serve God to live lives that are honoring to him and to go out and spread the good news to others that they might join us in eternity. You know, when you look at that wrath to come in the light of what it really is, it's, it's that coming period just before Christ returns. It's exciting from one point of view. It's horrible from another. You know, I was accused... Somebody on, in the Miami paper, I never even heard of them, but somehow they tuned into TBN. They talked about Chuck Smith and some of us being on the air and, and just being gleeful about the coming destruction of the world. I'm not gleeful about the destruction of the world. In fact, I'd like to take everybody with me that wants to come. All they've got to do is believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they'll come along. I'm not gleeful about it. And why am I bothering to preach to so many people? My ticket's already there. I'm going. Why do I bother to preach? Because I don't want anybody to be here during that hell of a time. And it grieves me. 
that people go about their way and, you know, well, I'm too young, I'll make a decision later, and there's not going to be any later. And those who just say, well, it's just those crazy people, you know, the gloom and doom prophets, we've heard them all before. Ah, Hal Lindsey, yeah, he's that modern-day Jeremiah. That's what a lot of people said. Time Magazine said that. Now, whatever I am, I'm what God made me. And I am, and I am crying like a prophet in the wilderness. Save yourself from what is coming. The wrath is coming. So what Paul says, look, you've never been out of our heart. And I've tried repeatedly to come back and see you. But Satan hindered us. Now how that happened, I don't know. But I know there were all kinds of hindrances to Paul getting back to Thessalonica. But he says, for who is our hope or our joy or crown of exultation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Now what a statement. At the highlight of every believer's experience will be when we first are caught up to meet Christ in the air. When he comes for the church. And that's what this is talking about. When he comes for the church, we're all going to be caught up there. And he says, and when I'm caught up to meet there, you are going to be our crown of rejoicing. You are going to be our crown. In other words, he's saying, you're not important to me, baloney. He says, when Christ comes and you're all standing in the presence of God with me, you're going to be my crown of joy. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to think about when all the people you've helped come to know Christ are going to be standing with you before the throne of God when Christ comes. I'm looking forward to that day. Because I'll tell you, and for more than one reason, but most of the people who have come to Christ through me, I've never seen, nor ever will meet, before Christ comes. Because most of the people who are, that I've helped come to the Lord have come through reading one of my books. But I'm looking forward to that time when I can meet them face to face with Christ. That'll be my crown. Never want for anything more than that. So get with it, folks. We're very near his coming. Live a life worthy of the one who's loved you in such a way to give you eternal life and forgiveness as a gift. And bring as many people to know Jesus Christ as you possibly can while you can because they're going to be standing with you at the throne of God.